Okay, so welcome to this week's uh, Heidelberg Joint Astronomy Colloquium, everyone. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege today to have Peter Johansson with us. Uh, Peter is a world leading expert in galaxy formation and evolution modeling, galaxy mergers and superstar cluster formation, uh, supermassive black holes, post Newtonian dynamics, and more recently, he's been adding gravitational waves uh, to that wide array of expertise. Uh, Peter started his PhD, uh, received his PhD in, in 2006 from the University of Cambridge. And after that, he became a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garching. Uh, since 2009, he is an associate professor, was an associate professor at the University of Helsinki in 2017. He became a full professor there. And at the moment, uh, Peter holds an ERC consolidator grant, which, among others, is uh, aimed at quantifying the gravitational wave emission signal uh, from in, in spiraling supermassive black holes. And I suspect he's going to tell us a lot more about that today. So please, Peter, if you want, you can start uh, sharing your screen. Uh, as, uh, Peter will talk today about simulating black hole dynamics and gravitational wave emission in galactic scale simulations. And as per the Heidelberg tradition, I would kindly ask everyone to briefly unmute and give Peter a very warm uh, applause, a very warm welcome. So, thank you, Diederik, uh, for the very nice invi uh, invitation. I'm very honored to give a talk here and also for the very nice introduction. Just a small correction, I was not a postdoc at the MPA, I was actually a postdoc at the Universität Steinwart in München, so at the University Observatory. I did work with people at the MPA, but I was not actually employed there. Okay, uh, uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is some recent work we've been doing here in Helsinki, and this is really on trying to simulate black hole dynamics and, and uh, also gravitational wave emission in large scale galactic scale simulations. So we have a number of papers uh, on this topic and I'll highlight here two in red, which I will mainly be talking about today. So uh, what we want to do first, of course, is a bit of a motivation. So supermassive black holes. They're found in the centers of all massive galaxies. Also, we know that there's a very strong correlation between the mass of the supermassive black hole and the stellar mass in the galaxy. So here the uh, velocity dispersion is plotted. But this kind of implies that there's some kind of co-evolution. Also, in, in addition, uh, we think that energetic feedback from supermassive black holes might be actually responsible for setting this maximum mass of galaxies. So here is uh, dark matter mass function and the actual observed mass function of galaxies. And you see there's an exponential cutoff here of high masses. And this might well be due to feedback from supermassive black holes. And then finally, uh, in the standard Lambda CDM model, you would expect, of course, that galaxies uh, go, grow through mergers. And then that means, of course, that mergers of supermassive black holes in the centers of the galaxies should also be quite common. And this could now also be detected, not yet, but with, with future gravitational wave experiments in space, such as LISA, for example. So what do we want to do in a numerical simulation? So essentially, the primary goal is very simple. We want to calculate the positions, velocities, and accelerations of all particles in a gravitational field, and typically only using Newton's law of gravity. That's usually sufficient. So this is the simple equation you want to do. But, uh, and this actually is done exactly. So in a collisional direct end body simulation, you can do this exactly. But uh, you will immediately see that you need to calculate two different distances here. Uh, and uh, that means that, I mean, uh, uh, the uh, calculation scales usually is n squared, where n is the number of particles. And if you want to do a large system uh, with a large number of particles, you typically need to make some approximations. Because of course, in the Milky Way, we have between 200 to 400 billion of stars whereas the typical n-body simulation has only some millions of particles, so much less than the actual number. So what do you do? You do some approximations. And uh, one common way of doing this is to use something called a tree code. So in a tree code, you simply just uh, clump particles together. So distant particles are clumped together to these larger nodes in some sense, and you calculate the combined force from them. So essentially, if you want to know the orbits of stars in, a, in your galaxy, you don't need to resolve the internal orbits of a distant galaxy. It's enough to approximate the combined potential. Another approach is to use a grid code. 
So in a grid code, you distribute the particles on a grid. And instead of calculating the force from every, uh, every particle, you clump the particles together on the, on the grid, and then you calculate the force from that. And crucially, both of these methods scale much better for with n. So n log n for tree code, and n log n also for grid code, where this is the number of grid cells. And this is, of course, for large n, much less than n squared. But crucially, in all of these co uh, codes, the gravity is softened on small scales. Uh, so this means that the gravity is not exact, like in the collisional n body code, but it's softened. And this is an example of a, of a simple type of softening. So what is the current state of the art for this kind of uh, uh, calculations for black hole dynamics in simulations? So firstly, you can do the dynamics of black holes traditionally in this kind of hydrodynamical softened simulations that's been done uh, many times. You can have tens to hundreds of millions of particles. For example, example codes like Gadget 3, Aripo or Ramses. Uh, but then you can also do this collisional direct end body simulation uh, which the force is much more accurate, but here you are restricted to typically of the order of a million particles or so. And a typical exp example of this kind of a code is n-body seven. And also these simulations typically do not include gas. And what we have been doing now is to try to kind of combine uh, the best of both worlds. So what we do is that we have developed a new code called GetU, which is basically a modification of this gadget tree code and you can think of that, that we have a gadget tree code, and then we have this kind of magnifying glass on top of the black hole. So in a hybrid approach, we have these regularized regions, and then we try to very accurately resolve the dynamics inside this region close to the black holes. So we have kind of the, try to have the best of both, both approaches in this, this our approach. So what happens when black holes merge? So what are the stages in a supermassive black hole merger? So essentially you have three stages in this process. First, in large scales, you have dynamical friction from stars uh, and gas. On small scales, also drag from a gas disk uh, can be important. So what this means is that the black hole moves through a sea of stars, attracts them, and, and you get the uh, over density behind that, and you will scale with the mass uh, squared uh, of, of the object, of the black hole in this case, the force. Next, on smaller scales, you will have this kind of uh, complicated three body interactions where the binary interacts with single stars, single stars are kicked out uh, in a complex three body interactions and they will take with them energy and angular momentum and the black hole will shrink. And here the inverse of the scale uh, of the semi-major axis of the binary scales with the density and inversely with the velocity dispersion of the stars. And then finally, at very small scales, emission of gravitational waves will be important. But this is at really small scales. Uh, so you have to get to very close separations of maybe, uh, depending on the mass of the black holes, but still of the order of, of a sub parsec or so. And, and then you can drive them to coalescence. And at the moment, there is not really any simulation code that's able to resolve all the full black hole merging process in a single simulation. And this is, this is the goal we have in our approach here. So what have we done? We have developed a code uh, which is called get you and now the first thing you've been waiting for and thinking about the whole talk maybe is what is get you <clears throat> so get you the word get you may, means chain in finnish uh, so the word chain for in, in finnish and the reason for this is that uh, we use uh, something called an algorithmically regularized chain for the calculation uh, and uh, this is actually is not invented by us it's invented by Mikola and Merit already and we have adopted this kind of uh, modeling into the gadget code then. And this makes two body collisions integrable and using a simple leap, leapfrog integrator. And what also the code supports, it supports uh, a multiple number of these chain regions. So these high resolution uh, regions can be around every black hole in the simulation and we can resolve that. And then finally, it also includes post Newtonian corrections and we use corrections up to order 3.5 pn. So this is a term that goes the scales with the speed of light to the power of minus seven. And uh, for post Newton corrections, you have to take into account that now the gravitational potential does not, not only depend on the forces that only depend on the position, but also on the velocity of the particles. So you have to take this into account. So, uh, so you have to have a, a pn correction to have, uh, depend on uh, velocities and also possibly spins. If you include spins, that's also an option for the black holes. 
And in principle, this PN approach is valid up to roughly 10 Schwarzschild radio so. And if you've never seen a PN correction term, here's just an example. You have the Newtonian gravity, and then you have the PN terms here. Uh, this is the first order correction. So these PN terms is not something we have developed. There are other people who worked on this. We have just uh, programmed this in into our code. So the, in some sense, you could think of them as a cooling table. It's, it's just a way of calculating the, the acceleration of the particles a bit more accurately. So we just put this into the code. And then we come to this algorithmic regularization. Just briefly, what is the idea with this? Uh, so the, the, reason, the idea here is that the dynamics in the high resolution region is regularized. So the idea is there that you try to avoid this uh, forced divergence in, in the equations of motions. So basically you do a time transformation that avoids this uh, forced divergence. This is already developed also by other people, Mikko and Danikawa, Frito Tremay, 1999. And then we organize the particles into a chain. Uh, uh, this is because you want to reduce the round off errors in the calculation between interparticle vectors. And then you integrate uh, particle orbits within this chain region, very high precision using a technique called a bullish stir extrapolation. So how you can think about this is that for each gadget time step, the particles within the chain region take uh, hundreds uh, of the order of a hundred small sub steps so, so you very accurately uh, calculate the orbits and positions, and then you go, uh, you tell the uh, result to the gadget code, and it takes a big time step again, and then you update the, uh, the particles in the small time step uh, within the chain region. This is essentially how it works. And graphically, you can have a look here. You have the black holes here, and then you have all chain particles, so all particles within this chain region. Uh, are stellar particles, so only stellar particles at the moment are allowed. Of course, a black hole as well, and stellar particles are allowed within this region. This is a user-defined uh, parameter, how large this influence radius is. The larger the radius, uh, of course, the slower the simulation because you will have more particles in this region. Typical sizes of the order of 5 to 20 parsecs in the simulations I will talk about today. Then you have a perturber region, so particles which are and you use a strong tidal perturbation to the chain system. Typically, this is uh, the twice the influence radius. And then you have very far field particles that are far away from this system, and they are just uh, act as ordinary gadget tree particles. So this is, this is the approach of, of the code. And actually, uh, just recently, we also made some additional uh, improvements to the code. So we are actually not uh, always using a chain anymore. So we have a new integrator called M star, where you use instead of a chain, a minimum spanning tree. So this is just a different way of uh, ordering, uh, calculating the distances between the particles. Another thing we also have been working on is to, to improve the parallelization of the code, uh, especially the bullish stir extrapolation. And this plot here shows uh, in blue, the old uh, version, the original get you, and now the improved version. And we reach much better parallelization and can use much higher number of particles in, in this uh, high resolution chain region. And this is really crucial for simulations uh, that include gas, because in these simulations, you can have a very high number of particles in the chain region. So the original get you were able to do maybe 500 particles in the high resolution region, whereas with this updated version, we have already tens of thousands of particles in that region. Okay, so let's look at some animations. So this is now animation with five black holes uh, and, and a thousand particles around each, each uh, black holes. And you see this dynamics, particles flying around, uh, they're bound and jumping back and forth. That's not so interesting, but if you look at the same animation, you now see colored the chain regions. So every black hole has its own chain region. Uh, and then when they join, they have the same color, they're in the same chain. Now a black hole, when it's thrown out, it will have its own chain region, then it's back in again, and they will have an interaction in the same chain region and, and so on. So this is all done adaptively, this merging of uh, these regions and so on. So this is just a low resolution simulation showing the idea. Okay, so that was kind of the code technical background details. So let's now go to the actual, uh, some of the results. So what have we have been studying with this uh, simulation code now. So one of the first problems we started looking at, at was the formation of core galaxies. So what is a core elliptical galaxy? These are among the most massive galaxies in the universe. 
and particularly they are known for the fact that they have a, a huge deficit of light in the center, so they're missing light. So here are the typical surface brightness profiles of a, of a bunch of elliptical galaxies, and in red are highlighted these core ellipticals. So they have a nearly constant surface brightness. They are typically very massive, slowly rotating, have also boxy isophotes, and have very massive black holes. So this uh, prime example here is NGC 1600, which has a black hole of a mass of roughly 10 to the 10, or 1.7 times 10 to the 10 solar masses. And, and the leading theory for how this has formed is that you have a merger, a dry merger, so a gas pool merger between two massive galaxies, uh, two early type galaxies, and then the black holes will spiral to the center and they will interact with the stars uh, in the center and basically empty the galaxy of stars by, by ejecting most of the stellar mass. Uh, it's roughly stellar mass corresponding to the masses of the black holes. So this is a way of getting these very flat, flat profiles by losing stars. Uh, ejecting stars. And now we wanted to study this in a simulation. So what we did here is that we run a collisionless uh, mergers. So this is a simulation with, with no gas, two massive uh, elliptical galaxies. Uh, they were set up with this kind of uh, DNN density profiles, which are commonly used. You have uh, dark matter and stars, and then you put in a central supermassive black hole. And now we basically try to simulate the final dry major merger that this NGC 1600 galaxy likely experienced. Uh, here are the uh, parameters. So the number of stellar particles per galaxy is, is relatively high for this kind of n-body type of simulation. So 4 million particles, and, and then you have 10 million dark matter particles. Uh, and what we did is that we run several uh, simulations. We first run a simulation with no black holes. Then we uh, have the final simulation, which has the simulated combined or the observed combined black hole mass. And then we have intermediate models with smaller uh, black holes. Otherwise, the simulations are identical, only the black hole mass is different. So now what we see here at the top, you can see this kind of a, a, a plot, a, a point plot of the simulation. Uh, and the top, we have no black holes. So clearly in, in the no black hole case, you can see that the end, end result is, is a galaxy, Caspi galaxy. It clearly has a relatively high surface brightness in the center, and, and this is what you would expect. And the bottom, you have the black holes included, and you can very clearly see that the end result is very different. So here you see that the surface brightness will be much lower, and clearly the black holes have interacted with, with the stars and thrown out a lot of the stars in this system. And this can also be seen in the surface brightness plot. So here on the left, uh, we have the surface brightness plot for the stellar, uh, for the models with a stellar uh, profile, density profile of gamma one, and here is one with steeper stellar profile, gamma one and a half. So we run two sets of simulations. The dark matter properties were the same, but we varied the steepness of the stellar profile. And now you clearly see this, uh, the pink line, the first line here, is the simulation with no black holes. And here you can very clearly see that you see a cuspy profile. You get uh, you don't get the suppression of the light in the center. Of course, what we actually simulate is not light, we simulate mass, and then we just assume a constant mass to light ratio of four, which was the same that's observed by Jens Thomas in his observational paper. And what you see as, as expected is a systematic decrease in the surface brightness as a function of increasing mass. So when you increase the mass of the black holes, you have a uh, you see a clear uh, systematic decrease in the surface brightness or the, or the surface mass density. Okay, another thing you can also study is, is the velocity uh, anisotropic profiles. So what this is, is that you calculate this uh, parameter called beta. So this basically tells you how the orbits uh, or, or the uh, velocity uh, uh, dispersions of the particles are biased. So if you have a large positive number here, uh, you have a radial bias, so you have orbits with, with radial bias. And if you have a negative number, you have tangential bias. And what you clearly see here as a function of radius, so this is the core radius now for the gamma one and gamma half plots, is that when the black hole mass increases, uh, you, will get, uh, you will get an increasingly negative beta which means that you get an increasingly more tangentially biased 
velocity distribution. So this means that orbits, stars on radial orbits are more likely to interact with the black hole because they have deeper plunging orbits closer to the binaries and they will be then preferentially removed or ejected. Usually they're not ejected from the galaxy, but they're ejected to the outer parts of the galaxy. So what you will then see is that you will get this kind of a tilted uh, beta profile where you have a negative inner part and a positive outer part. The initial conditions, by the way, are isotropic. So we start with the beta zero profiles in the beginning. And, and this is then uh, caused from the merger. And the dashed line, the Black uh, Symphony Black Hole Survey here show observed galaxies, and you see that they have similar trends to what the simulations are showing here. So this was encouraging. Okay, now from core formation, I will move on to something else and talk a little bit about uh, gravitational waves instead. So uh, typically, uh, the first thing here to notice in this plot is as a function of time, I show the separation between uh, uh, the black holes. And now I'm comparing here a typical gadget softened simulation. So in this kind of a gadget simulation, uh, uh, what happens is that uh, the black hole dynamics cannot be resolved beyond uh, below the gravitational softening length. So what these simulations do is that typically the black holes are merged instantly when they come within a softening length and when their relative velocity is below uh, some, for example, half the sound speed. So that would happen here. But now in the get you simulation, the, uh, the black holes do not merge here. They continue to smaller and smaller separations. And now you see there are two lines. There's a blue line and a red line. So the red line is a get you simulation where we had no post Newtonian corrections on. So we, can, we have no gravitational softening for the interaction so we can get to smaller and smaller scales. But because we have no post Newtonian corrections, we would have no gravitational wave emission. And then we will never get to the final merger. So only the blue line here, which is a catch simulation with the PN corrections will drive the simulation, the black hole to a merger. And now you see compared to the gadget softened simulation, the, separa the difference is quite large. You know, Now we actually merge the black holes to the separation of a, a factor of 5,000 smaller in, in, in separation in distance and about 200 million years later. So we get a physically motivated merger criterion. Uh, we use the Peters formula here for that which is commonly used. This is a uh, gravitational wave emission or, or this change of the semi-major axis uh, due to gravitational wave emission at PN 2.45 uh, level. Uh, of course, uh, we have a post-Newtonian simulation, which means it's not general relativity and our black hole uh, approximation breaks down roughly at the separation of uh, 10, uh, 10 uh, Schwarzschild radii or so. So we, below that, we cannot resolve the dynamics anymore. But this is a lot better than a softened simulation where, where the dynamics breaks down in this simulation, for example, you know, already at uh, tens of parsecs. So which is of course a lot more than a tens of Schwarzschild radii. Okay, uh, then uh, what is kind of the goal of, of these studies is to study the gravitational wave background. So what is the gravitational wave background? So, so the idea is that if you have many supermassive black hole binaries, they're all in a different stage of the evolution they will be emitting gravitational waves. And when you combine all the different uh, supermassive black holes, the emission from all of them uh, at the different stages, you get this gravitational wave background. This is something, for example, that pulsar timing arrays is trying to detect. And here's an example now of a binary. This is just to illustrate the point. Uh, a binary black hole, 10 to the 9 solar masses, uh, both of black holes at the redshifts of 0.25. And there you see as a function of eccentricity uh, of the black hole, you see at what frequencies they emit uh, gravitational waves. So if you would have a circular binary, eccentricity zero, then all the gravitational waves would be emitted at the N2 harmonic. So this means two times the orbital frequency. But if you have high frequency, you will see that the gravitational waves, uh, uh, sorry, very high eccentricity of the black hole, then the gravitational waves will be spread over many, many frequencies. So that's what is shown here. And in a, any kind of merger, the gravitational wave emission will drive, drive the orbit to, to circular. So in the end, you will have a circular orbit, but initially you will start off with quite a high eccentricity, typically 0.9 or so. So this just shows you over many harmonics where the gravitational wave emission will come out. So what is plotted here is 
the frequency of the gravitational wave, and, and this is the strain, so kind of the amplitude of the wave. Okay, so what is uh, affecting the amplitude and shape is affected by the density of the binary mergers, their masses, eccentricities, and also very important is the environment, which is the stellar scattering between the black holes interactions with the stars. Okay, so this has already been studied in this kind of global simulations. Uh, so illustrious simulation, which I know that many people in Heidelberg is also working with. So what you could do, what illustrious is, so it's a large cosmological simulation, 106.5 megaparsec box, a large volume simulation. It's run with a repo, but it's a softened simulation, meaning that the gravitational softening in this simulation is 0.7 kiloparsecs. So black holes in this simulation will typically merge when they are separated by one kiloparsec or so. So you don't have any dynamical information below that separation. So what they did here, so this is uh, Kelly et al. especially, they, they, did a, they have to do a subgrid modeling if you want to follow the dynamics of the black holes below the gravitational softening length, which you don't, uh, which you don't dynamically resolve things there. So they have models for this. So they construct analytical models for dynamical friction, for stellar loss cone scattering, for gas track from circular binary viscous disk and the gravitational wave emission. All of this is subgrid modeling. It cannot be directly resolved in the simulation. This is just an example of a most massive cluster in illustrious volume. And using this kind of model, you can then predict what the stochastic gravitational wave background should look like. And here is a plot from their paper. So this is from Kelly et al, 2017. Uh, the gravitational wave strain as a function of frequency. And a general prediction of these models is that you get this uh, minus uh, uh, two thirds power law in frequency if you assume purely gravitational wave driven coalescence. But in more realistic models, you also include in environmental interactions and they will result in this kind of a spectral turnover, which you see here. The different colors here show different eccentricities. So very high eccentricities, the turnover happens already uh, earlier here. And crucially that star here, this is a pulsar timing array measurement of the gravitational wave background. So it's tantalizing that the kind of simulation predictions are right at the cusp of what the uh, pulsar timing array uh, uh, array should be seeing. And actually last September, there was this first uh, kind of tentative detection of something from the pulsar timing arrays. Uh, it's still not clear if it's uh, or most likely maybe not what we were expecting from background of, from black hole mergers, but still, I mean, this is something that might be within reach soon. And now what we wanted to study then basically is to try to check, I mean, how valid are these assumptions made in these models? So these semi-analytic models. So if we now dynamically and directly uh, resolve uh, the dynamics of the black holes, we want to check how accurately these semi-analytic models usually predict that behavior. Uh, and that's what we did is that we now analyzed uh, uh, a similar set of simulations that we already discussed earlier so used for the core studies, but now we had this unequal mass mergers of massive early type galaxies, A, B, C, D. And then we also run one comparison simulation of a much more reasonable merger. So with much lower masses uh, uh, and a higher stellar densities in the center, because these core galaxies can be a bit peculiar in the sense that they don't have, they have very low numbers of stars in the center, which will affect the stellar scattering. We are not in the moment poss uh, possible to run this kind of a global illustrious type of simulation with get you yet. So, so we are going step by step towards that. Also this simulation was collisionless, so no gas. And the initial conditions were modeled again with this then and profiles, gamma 1.5 or one and, uh, for the stars and, and gamma one for the dark matter. So similar initial conditions to before. And then we simulated the final phases of the black hole in spirals at very high resolution started the separation, usually at five parsecs or so for these massive binaries and half a parsec for, for the lower mass binary. And the initial eccentricity, as you see here in the final column, is very high for all of these because they come from relatively radial, I mean, merger, uh, from mergers on relatively radial orbits. And this is kind of now illustrating just a, a, a pretty picture of what's going on. So you have the two galaxies, they're first separated uh, from a large separation, and then they get closer, your interactions with stars, and, and finally, gravitational wave emission. 
And what we did is then to compare now the resolved get you as a binary evolution to two of these analytic models that are very commonly used uh, for predicting on what happens to the black holes below the softening limit, so the resolution limit. So one of these models is the Peters model from 1964. And this is uh, assuming that there's only gravitational wave emission at this PN 2.5 term uh, order. Then you get this simple formula for how this, uh, uh, the semi-major axis and the eccentricity should evolve. And then you have a bit more elaborate model called the Peters Quinlan model, which also then includes kind of an analytic uh, model for stellar scattering. So it takes into account how the black hole scatter from st the stars in, in the simulation. And this depends then on the density and the dispersion of the stars. But then crucially, there are these kind of fitting constants, H and K, which, which have been derived by fitting these kind of uh, 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 functions to some prior simulations. So they are really empirically fitted constants. And now we compare the Ketu simulation to these runs. Firstly, looking at how the scale factor uh, evolves as a function of time. Uh, and we always normalize get you to, to the zero and, and look at the difference. So now we see that the Peters uh, formula, clearly, uh, if you just have the gravitational wave emission, they, they overestimate the time, overpredict on, on the merger time. So, so meaning, I mean, it, it takes too long in these uh, models for the merger to happen compared to the, the zero value. Whereas the Peters Quinlan models underpredict the coalescence time. And, and this uh, reason for that is primarily in these simulations, so especially A through D, is that these were core galaxy simulations, so they had very low stellar uh, components, densities in the center. And these models, so basically the parameters are showed, the H and K, they are calibrated to more normal simulations with higher stellar densities. So now uh, the assumption in this simulatic model was that the stellar density is much higher than it in reality was. So this clearly now shows you that you can get a, a 0.2 giga year difference if you use the analytic approximations compared to the real value uh, uh, of the simulation. And on the right, you show the same idea here, but now for the eccentricity, and you see how the eccentricity differs. So the zero level is the Ketu simulation, and you see how the analytic calculations uh, di differ. Again, you see systematically the Peters underpredict and, and the Peters Greenland overpredict the eccentricity but differences on the level of, point, um, uh, of point 0.1 or so. So not dramatic, but still, still significant. And what we then next did is that we started calculated also the total energy spectrum of, of the gravitational waves. So what we did here, we don't have a cosmological volume, but we, what we did instead is that we calculated the total amount of energy emitted over the binary lifetime. And this is kind of a, indicator for the gravitational wave background in the sense that the background is made up of several sources in different phases. And then if you take the integrated emission of a single source, you can make like a poor man's approximation of what the gravitational wave background might look like. And uh, uh, what we did is that we calculated the gravitational wave emission using this kind of a semi-analytic Kepler and orbit average formula, which is very fast and fairly accurate as long as the black holes are separated by more than 100 Schwarzschild radii or so. But when the black holes are very close, this causes two big errors. And then we did a direct discrete Fourier transform of the waveform. And this allows including also waveform PN corrections. So, so not only PN corrections to the orbits of the black holes, but also to the waveform. We made some corrections there. And, and this uh, will be important when you are down at 100 Schwarzschild radii. Remember that the calculation stops roughly at 10 Schwarzschild radius separations or so. And this is just showing that the two gravitational wave calculation methods are in relatively good agreement. So this, uh, uh, where they overlap. So the FFT method and the semi method uh, reproduce each other uh, well. And you could basically have done the FFT for the whole simulation, but it's much, much slower than the semi approach. So that's why we use that for large separations. Okay, and here are the results. So for the different uh, uh, mergers, A, B, C, D, X. So what you see here is the integrated gravitational spectra as a function of frequency. Uh, so they're all fairly similar. I mean, the X is, is widely offset. The reason, of course, is that the black holes here were a factor of a 
100 less massive uh, compared to the black holes here. So that's why they're similar. And you see the characteristic shape of an initially eccentric binary. So you have eccentric binary, you have a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, the frequencies, uh, the high eccentricity binary gravitational wave strain is distributed over many frequencies. And then you get the peak and you get kind of a flattening here at high frequencies when the black holes are becoming more and more circular. And now the key plot here is really, really on the right, because now we co compare now the emitted uh, energy in gravitational wave, uh, the ratio to the predictions from these Peters and the Peters Quinlan models. Uh, and, and you see here uh, that uh, you can have initially quite large separations for low frequencies, but, uh, but this is uh, when the black holes are still quite far from each other and then the stellar scatterings are very important. This is not so relevant because that's not the window where the, uh, the pulsar timing arrays can observe the, the black holes. So the highlight here or the inset here is the window. This is the frequency range where pulsar timing arrays can observe these binary systems. And here you see that the agreement is a lot better. So, so here the difference is between the KETU calculation and these simple uh, analytic approximations for this quantity is only on the 10% level or so. And it, this is pretty good agreement. So it's, it's uh, the semi-analytic approaches used uh, in, in previous studies are, are actually quite good and, uh, and uh, definitely not way off. I mean, uh, in our study, the difference is only 10%. Of course, we are a bit generous to the, the simulations here because we, we start at a five parsec separation and let's say if you would have compared to a simulation with no dynamic information below 100 parsecs or so, then the differences might also have been larger. And then also you have to take into account that especially the stellar scattering formula, the constants in this formula have to be calibrated for your given simulation, because that will vary quite a lot depending on what kind of stellar environment you have, if you have a cuspy or a cord stellar environment, for example. Okay, uh, now, Towards the end, I will just talk briefly about some really new stuff that we've been working on. And, and that's everything I showed so far was basically get your simulations, uh, collisionless simulations with no gas. And, and that of course is, is fine, but it's not really that what we are really after. So the main power of the get you code is because it's built on this gadget framework is that we can really combine these accurate dynamic simulations with hydrodynamic galaxy formation models. So that's really the goal, what we want to do. Uh, and we have now started working on this a lot. This is, this is the main point of the, the ERC project I have. And uh, what we want to do, for example, uh, what situation makes it a bit more complicated here is that the standard black hole feedback models, for example, do not work that well. So usually you assume a bond de Hoyle prescription uh, this is fine if you have a single black hole accreting and relatively poor resolution. But now what happens is in our simulation, as we saw before, we have a very uh, long prolonged uh, binary phase because the black holes merge much, much later. So we are now actually developing new black hole feedback models uh, that work for binaries as well. And this actually is not very easy because, uh, because you have to try to take into account uh, how the two binaries interact with the circum binary disk, which is usually uh, found in these systems. Uh, so this circum binary disks in principle could be resolved directly in, in a KETU simulation. But then of course the individual accretion disks, which are much smaller scales, they would not be resolved and there would have to be some kind of a subgrid modeling for that as well. And why we are interested in this is of course, uh, uh, the reason is LISA. So LISA is this triangular, I mean, three satellites uh, in this orbit to be launched uh, uh, 2035, no, well beyond sometime, end of 2030s. And the idea is that they would measure then gravitational waves uh, from these mergers of supermassive black holes. And LISA will be most sensitive to black holes, supermassive black holes in the mass range of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses. And these are not the black holes I showed earlier in this talk because these 10 to the 6 and the 7 solar mass black holes, these are typical black holes you would find in late type gas rich disk galaxies. So that's why it's really crucial to also understand better 
this, uh, this exact uh, black hole dynamics in simulations that include a gas component. And we have now some preliminary first results on this. This is not yet published. Uh, it's, uh, it's close to be, uh, be submitted. And what we've done here is that we run our first cosmological Ketu simulations of a zoom-in simulation. So this is now a, a simulation that includes gas, cooling, star formation, supernova feedback, all the standard black hole, uh, standard galaxy formation prescriptions. The black hole feedback model for this one is still uh, the actual quite simple, the, the Bondi Hoyle model. We have not yet uh, tested and calibrated our new binary model, it's coming. Uh, but uh, this just demonstrates that you can run this kind of simulation. Uh, this is run first with gadget. Black holes are seeded in massive dark matter halos and then evolved using standard black hole models similar to, to what Illustris, for example, uses, or Eagle. But what we then do is that we switch on the get you part and start doing the accurate dynamics at the redshifts of round one. So this is kind of highlighting the situation when you have many massive galaxies formed and you have black holes in their centers. And the reason why we cannot uh, turn on get you for right from the beginning, firstly, it's numerically uh, challenging. It's very, very much slower to run this kind of simulation. But the real reason is more critical because you need to have a sufficiently high mass ratio between the stellar particles and the supermassive black holes to accurately resolve the dynamics. And this mass ratio is roughly of the order of 10 to the three. So in this simulation, the stellar particle mass is 10 to the five solar masses. So we need to wait for the black holes to evolve to a mass of 10 to the eight solar masses or so before we can start resolving the interactions. But what you can then do is that in this kind of simulation, what we found, for example, is that we had a triple merger. So in a standard gadget simulation, the two galaxies would merge and the black holes would merge almost instantly. But in the Ketu simulation, we had a very different behavior. The black holes did not merge. It took a long time for them to spiral closer. And before they managed to merge, a third galaxy came in and, and knocked out one of the black holes and took its place instead. So you get qualitatively completely different results and also, of course, the interest here is that you could then calculate the gravitational wave emission from this kind of systems as well. Okay, this is still in prep, so, so it hopefully will be soon out. Okay, I think I'm more or less uh, done. I think I'm approaching 45 minutes now, so I'll just uh, give a brief summary and outlook. So uh, firstly, uh, what you can take home from this talk is that get you, what is it? It's a code version of gadget, includes this algorithmically regularized chain module, basically this high resolution region that makes two body collisions integrable by a simple leapfrog integrator. What we also found in the study with the cores uh, is that the cores form very rapidly on the order of a crossing time scale by supermassive black hole binary evolution. You see a very rapid formation of the core, emptying of the center. And then the Veloz distribution becomes increasingly more tangential over longer time scales. And this is also what the observations seem to indicate. You have core massive galaxies with very big black holes and tangential uh, Veloz distributions, which strongly indicate that there have been this binary black hole scouring process at, at work. And then we discussed a little bit gravitational waves and semiotic uh, comparison to semiotic models that are typically used in these simulations, large scale simulations. Uh, in unresolved cosmological simulations. And we found that the differences are, are quite low, only about 10% in the frequency range that can be covered by this pulsar timing array predictions at the moment. And finally, LISA, which will fly 15 years from now or so, will be most sensitive to gravitational waves from supermassive black holes, mass range 10 to 6, 10 to 7, that's why it's very important to model accurately the small scale dynamics in simulations that also include gas physics. And that's the main motivation of the Ketu code. Okay, thank you. I'll stop here and time for questions. Thank you very much, Peter. This uh, was really, really fascinating. And I have a question myself, but I see there are already two hands up. So I'll first go to the audience. Uh, ben, please go ahead. 
Thank you. Thank you. Excellent talk as always, Peter. Um, I'm curious about the initial formulation of Ketchu. You said that uh, basically you, you start from a leapfrog integrator and then use a, a stiff extrapolator like Berlich store. Would there be any advantage to trying to adapt this to use a, a sort of higher order symplectic integrator? as the primary integration, would that perhaps maybe reduce the number of sub-steps you might need to use? Or is that yeah. too yeah. wasteful? This, this is actually a very good question. It's a little bit technical. We, we have been thinking about different different approaches uh, because uh, the original catch you, the problem there was that as I alluded to, it didn't scale very well. It was difficult to have more than 500 particles. The code got really, really slow. But now we managed to update this by this M-star integrator, which Antti Rantala developed. He's now at MPA, actually. And, and that have improved the situation. But we still, for a big simulation, uh, I mean, cosmological volume simulation, where we would have like, uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of these high resolution region, we still need to improve on this. I'm not actually so much worried about, uh, about the accuracy. I'm more worried about performance. So we, we've been thinking about this kind of a solution where we would have a kind of intermediate layer of, of some kind of a other kind of like, like a Hermite integrator, for example, and then at the very inner core only have this regularized chain integrator. So if you would minimize that and it would still be accurate enough, that, that would be also an approach. And now actually, uh, Antti has also, Sorantal has also been developing this new split Hamiltonian methods at, at the MPA together with uh, Torsten Nam and Fokker Springer. And we're also looking into that op option if that would be faster. So, so, so this is kind of a general framework we are discussing and we are thinking of, of constant improvements. But so far, I mean, we, we're going with what works. It works for collisionless simulations very well. Uh, and now at least for moderate uh, uh, hydrodynamic simulations with uh, particle numbers within reasonable uh, uh, limits. Uh, a challenge, of course, is the mass ratio limit that we need. We need to have a sufficiently high mass ratio between the particles to be able uh, to do this. So in principle, there's nothing stopping this, but if you go for higher order, uh, it might slow down things even further. And I'm, my main concern is not the accuracy at the high resolution region, more the performance, but, but there, there are ideas. There are, there are definitely possibilities to do this as well. Exciting. Can't wait to see the results. Okay, thanks. Ralph, please go ahead. Um, very nice, very impressive. Thanks, Peter. Um, my question is about the range of applications you foresee. And I'm in particular thinking about globular clusters, intermediate mass black holes and their formation and evolution and stellar mergers in such systems. So do you think the code is applicable for that? Because the mass ratio may be an issue here, right? But this is actually an excellent point. Because this is exactly what we want to do. So I've just okay. hired a postdoc uh, from uh, Thorsten's group uh, who's worked on globular clusters uh, before. And, and this is one of the applications we want to work on as well. So, so not just, uh, I mean, um, black hole dynamics. Uh, you could also look, look for this. But you're right, uh, we will have to see, you know, for intermediate mass black holes, uh, stellar mass particles, maybe you have this 10 to the four um, mass ratio, it might work. But this, we have already worked in the group on globular cluster formation simulations uh, okay. in merging dwarf galaxies. So we had, a, we had a PhD student who's also now at the MPA uh, working on this. But, uh, but that simulation was just a gadget simulation. There was no get you in that yet. Mm. And our dream is to really run this kind of a globular cluster formation simulation, and then also internal the resolve the internal dynamics with with catching in the same thing. So this is also something that's in the pipeline uh, in, in some sense. Uh, so we want to expand this also to to smaller scales. But okay. my own background is more on this this galaxy side, so the massive side. But I'm I'm expanding now also into the cluster studies, trying to understand this as well. So definitely, this is something we look into. So we have the yeah, postdoc arriving and, and he will work also on stellar tides, for example, and, and also stellar evolution models. So, so it, it is definitely something we're looking into as well. Cool. Looking forward to the first results. Thank Thanks. you. I'll have a follow-up question to that after uh, the next question or any further. Uh, so Rainer, please, you go first. Yeah, uh, 
Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, I just uh, have a comment that I appreciate very much the innovative features actually you have in your code, especially the coupling to gadget, which makes it flexible, the gas dynamics perspective, the M star, this, this, uh, this uh, new principle uh, of the minimum spanning tree. But you mentioned in the beginning, actually, that there's no other code which can go from galaxy scale to the relativistic measure scale. Yeah, That's okay. not correct. Yeah, yeah okay. I published in our group, actually, they, they work going same, more or less same initial parameters, yeah. the head, but much smaller particles. And it's just, I mean, there's a big step forward now, but it, in 2018, it's uh, calm. Yeah, and, yeah. Ralph, I pull, I'm not pull. on the paper, but just, just for. Ralph, I full, fully agree. I apologize for that. It was maybe a little bit overhyped. It, it's, I'm, I'm a little bit in the ERC mode, so I'm overhyping a little bit. It's true. There, there are definitely also other codes doing this. Here, the main innovat innovation is maybe the hydrodynamic uh, connection. Absolutely. But, and the M star is also something very yeah. interesting. So, so there have been, of course, this kind of hybrid N body code approaches as well. So the, so the N body only approach I showed there in the beginning, that similar had been done. We may be pushing it a little bit to higher resolution here but the main yeah. innovation will come from the hydro runs so the cosmological zoom in runs for example with gas and feedback that that's uh, not easy to be done in a normal n-body code because you can't really treat the gas component very well but thanks you you're completely correct with that so just uh, uh, please if, if people have further questions please raise your hand in the meanwhile i, I have two questions myself so the first is uh, following up on Ralph's question, of course, most of the gravitational wave events discovered are uh, uh, of neutron star mergers. I figure that indeed with the extension that you're describing, well, again, mass ratio could be a problem, but you could start thinking about these. In terms of the, the energy across the gravitational wave spectrum, uh, how important is the contribution of supermassive black hole mergers compared to the neutron star mergers? This is a very naive question, but I suppose yeah. you know the answer and you might be able to start addressing that in the long run once you've acted. Yeah, this of course, this is a different, very different frequencies where this yeah. happens, right, right. So, yeah. so, so you will have to see, yeah, I don't know exactly because, you know, LIGO, LISA and the uh, pulse timing arrays, they're measuring completely different frequency windows and there's, there's some maybe overlap then with LISA especially, but, but not yet so much. It is a bit of a mystery, you know, this pulsar timing race is a bit frustrating. This is not something I'm involved in directly at all. I'm very impressed with the work they're doing, but it seems that they are all the time right at the cusp of detection. So, so always, always the models and, and, the, and the measurements are almost at the same. It's not like orders of magnitude off, but yet it hasn't really been found. So, so there's a little bit unclear. And, and I've actually the first pulse, the pulsar timing measurements now have already constrained the older models. So if, if you look at the older supermassive black hole models, they should have already been found, I mean, pulsar timing arrays, if they would have been correct. So there is something a little bit funny going on here, either with the models or with the pulsar timing arrays or with both, most likely. So, so we have to see. But I think it's quite exciting that, you know, this kind of fundamental neutron star pulsar research can really answer this kind of questions on supermassive black hole mergers and things like this. Yes. And of course, Lisa is, is the really big thing in the future then. So what, what, what's in the horizon then? But yeah, you have another question as well? Yes. So uh, regarding, I mean, indeed, the, the, the major uh, added benefit here of being able to do the hydrodynamics uh, self-consistently is, of course, is super exciting. How important are the details of your ISM model going forward? Because, of course, classically, these very large scale cosmological simulations do not cool down to very low temperatures. There is not much substructure in the ISM. There is a very, uh, there is an imposed equation of states. Are you working towards alleviating that? Because I imagine once you start to look at accretion disks and so on, you start to care about these types of ISM physics. Yeah, we, we are working on that as well for this kind of isolated runs, merger runs, where you can reach much higher resolution. So the work with Natalia, there we had uh, paid a lot of attention to the, the interstellar medium and also trying to get that right. Of course, the problem here is if you want to do a very high resolution ISM study, you do a dwarf merger or something like that, which typically don't have black holes. And then if you want to study supermassive black holes, you have to do a massive galaxies or a big box, and there's no way you could then resolve the ISM. I mean, numerically, it's not possible. So, so this, uh, the zoom-in simulation here uses kind of a, 
it uses metal dependent cooling, but there's no detailed, you know, ISM structure because the resolution gravitational softening length is of the order of a, you know, hundred, uh, a few hundred parsecs there. So, so it's definitely not going to resolve any, any really small scale, but it's still for a cosmological run, uh, I mean, uh, quite high resolution. So, but yeah, with SPH, it's hard to do super Lagrangian refinement yes, yes. without particle splitting. But if you would, would your uh, machinery be portable towards something like a repo where you can do the super? That is the plan. That is the plan. So actually, what we promised the EU, and probably we have to do it because we promised it to also make this kind of publicly available for other platforms. So not just Gadget. And we're also working with people in Ireland for Enzo. So use this also in Enzo. And a repo and gadget because of the structure of the code is quite similar. I don't think it would be impossible to do that. It's just a matter of um, who and when, basically. But but we hope we hope that this will become a, a standard kind of add-on. And also, actually, gadget four now that it's available. So Volker, Volker is uh, interested in having this also as like a compile option in some sense uh, for for gadget four at some point. So we are looking into this because because. Uh, I think it's important to make the next step for this kind of hydro runs and really accurate also resolve the small scale dynamics. You need to do something like this or, or similar. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Um, so this is my last call for any further questions. Okay, if not, then uh, there are two things uh, left to do right now. I would like to uh, announce next week's colloquium. Um, let me share the screen quickly. So next week, we will be having a colloquium by Enrico Ramirez Ruiz from UC Santa Cruz about uh, nuclear synthesis, uh, cosmic alchemy, as he calls it, in the era of gravitational wave astronomy, uh, more related towards uh, Newton star mergers and, and so on. I'm very much looking forward to seeing everyone uh, again next week. And before we all go, uh, can I ask please everyone to unmute again and warmly thank Peter for a fantastic talk. <laughs>